Howdy folks. Well, here we are up in the, the little room over the garage where I do most of my writing again. I've been trying to send out a little something every night for a while now. Uh, not sure how long I'll be able to maintain that string, but I figure a lot of you are holed up and hunkered down and it's nice to make a little connection even if it's just me talking into my phone. I'm going to do a piece tonight from a book called Danger Man Working. Came out a while back, just a collection, a lot of my different pieces. I love the I love the cover of this one. I don't know that you can really see it on the phone there, but it's an actual archival photo from from the Wisconsin Historical Society, and it's of an old farmer, and he is disengaging the power to his silo filler, which is this machine that mangles up corn and shoots it up into the silo. He's disengaging the power by kicking the belt off the pulley while the machine is running. It's just a litany of safety violations. And growing up, those old times were still around when I was a kid, and, and, and I remember them. And we used to joke, they're the kind of guys that if you said, hey, Bob, what's two plus three? Bob would go, five. Little amputated finger joke for you there, folks. So I've been trying to read kind of light, funny stuff, and tonight's isn't heavy, but it's just not as funny. But I wanted to read it just because... It's uh, one of those pieces where a, a kid who grew up baling hay in Chippewa County, Wisconsin, just never saw stories like this coming or, or experiences like this. And this involved a gospel group called the Blind Boys of Alabama, and they recorded an album very near me, and I was allowed to write the liner notes. One day my neighbor called. He was recording an album, wondered if I'd write the liner notes. The studio was just a couple of cornfields away. So I drove over there. All around, the world was white. The snow that winter had fallen in biblical proportions. Into this clean slate landscape stepped four blind men from Alabama. They came to sing the gospel. Waiting were two Midwestern men. Justin Vernon and Phil Cook were boys in a band when they discovered the music of Sam Cook. Then they discovered Sam Cooke's songs about Jesus. But these were not hymns. Hereabouts, hymns were measured and stayed. In Sam Cooke's music, the boys heard the lexicon of faith, but the rhythm, the soul, of something else entirely. From Cooke, they moved on to the staple singers. Sister Rosetta Tharp, Mahalia Jackson. And one day, they discovered the Blind Boys of Alabama. In time, the two men grew up and drew apart. There were wounds in that, although even now they would agree their accumulated hours of darkness had been at worst slightly cloudy. But when the shadows fell, each man turned to the holy blues, and among the most consoling lights that shone on them were the blind boys of Alabama. And now these boys, these men of the South, were finding their way north, passing between bare trees to a snowbound building off a Wisconsin country road. The room built to capture sound was cut squarely into the northern soil, solidly sunk below the frost line and banked in earthen stillness. Upstairs, the men stomped their boots clean and prepared to descend. Downstairs, the music, in the form of air yet to be breathed, waited. When sustaining legends cross your threshold, you show respect and deference, and then you get to work. The session lasted four days. In the studio and at the table over bread broken between takes, there were those who believed and those who wondered. But the great miraculous mystery of gospel music lies less in its power over believers and more in its power to move those who believe otherwise or those who believe not at all. Thus, Dr. King addressed a split nation in cadence drawn from pulpit and song. When there is glory in the throat, every listener dares dream of grand transcendence. One night as the recording went on, there was a knock at the door. Neighbors from up the road, a young girl and her father, the girl on the cusp of her teens. She knew nothing of the Alabamans. She stood in the shadow of a corner and listened. Please, sang the man at the microphone, please take me to the water. And on the way home, 
In the dark, as snow squeaked beneath the tires, the girl said, I will remember this night all my life. There's a point at the dead center of winter when it is difficult to summon the memory of green. Every branch is black against the sky. Leaves exist only as an article of faith. Imagine then a photograph of a sweet green tree. The tree is on an island alone. The encircling water appears white, so white it could be snow. The whiteness leaves the tree skirted in mystery rooted in this world and yet otherworldly. The tree says heaven is nearer than we know, that heaven is recognizable, that there are things to be seen even if we cannot see. If you were raised in snow, you know of its pure miracle. On the clearest, coldest days, the crystals pass to vapor with no pause to be liquid, sublimation from the Latin meaning raised up. When the last song was sung, there were drifts to the door. The four blind men formed a line, each man's hand on the shoulder of the man before him and stepped sure-footedly into the white. So thanks Justin and Phil for letting me come over and watch those sessions and then write about them. Um, by the way, the name of that album is I'll Find a Way. Track it down, have a listen, spin it tonight. Um, there's, there's great comfort in that album. All right. Um, see you down the road. Take care of each other. Good night.